the three climate change cases decided by the court in 2024 raised new and difficult legal issues relating to jurisdiction, exhaustion of domestic remedies and victim status on the admissibility side, and the nature and extent, if any, of positive obligations on member states under the Convention and access to justice on the merits side. Given the novelty of the questions raised, the three cases were relinquished to the Grand Chamber by chambers from three different sections of the court. They were heard by the same composition of the Grand Chamber. In Verein Klima Senioren in Schweiz, the court emphasised that it could only deal with any human rights issues arising as a result of climate change within the limits of the exercise of its competence under Article 19 of the Convention. In addition, any judicial intervention, whether at national or international level, cannot replace or substitute the action which must be taken by the legislative and executive branches of government. The remit of domestic courts and the Strasbourg Court must thus be seen as complementary to such democratic processes to combat climate change and its adverse effects. However, the Court also recognised that in the specific context of climate change, intergenerational burden sharing assumes particular importance given that it's clear that future generations are likely to bear an increasingly severe burden of the consequences of present failures and omissions to combat climate change. The court also explained the differences between the issues which arise in classic environmental cases decided with reference to Articles 2 and 8 of the Convention and those which arise in climate change cases such as those before it. The former category of cases concerns specific sources from which environmental harm emanates and those exposed to that harm can be localised with a reasonable degree of certainty. The existence of a causal link between harm and effects is generally determinable. In contrast, the sources of climate change, the consequences for the environment and its adverse effects on the living conditions of various human communities and individuals are complex and multiple. Thus, while drawing some inspiration from the principles set out in its existing environmental case law, the Court sought in these cases to develop a more appropriate and tailored approach as regards the various Convention issues which may arise in this climate change context. In the leading case, Verein Klima Senioren in Schweiz and others, it noted an evolution of scientific knowledge, social and political attitudes and legal standards concerning the necessity of protecting the environment including in the context of climate change. It recognised that environmental degradation has created and is capable of creating serious and potentially irreversible adverse effects on the enjoyment of human rights. Given the abundant scientific and other material at its disposal, it proceeded with its assessment by taking it as a matter of fact that there is sufficiently reliable indication that anthropogenic climate change exists that it poses a serious current and future threat to the enjoyment of human rights guaranteed under the Convention, that states are aware of it and capable of taking measures to effectively address it, and that the relevant risks are projected to be lower if the rise in temperature is limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. In the case of Duarte Agostino and others, the first question that the court had to deal with was the claim by the applicants that the other respondent states, other than Portugal, where they reside, have extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, and therefore should be held liable in relation to the adverse effects of climate change on them as residents of Portugal. In considering this claim, the court recognized certain exceptional aspects of climate change. Uh, firstly, that states do have ultimate control over the activities of, uh, uh, that produce greenhouse gas emissions on their territories. Secondly, that there is a certain causal relationship between those territorial emissions of each state and the negative impacts on the rights and well-being of people living outside their borders in other countries. And thirdly, the court recognized that the problem of climate change is of a truly existential nature for humankind in a way that sets it apart from other cause and effect situations. That said, uh, this was not sufficient for the court to create a novel ground for extraterritorial jurisdiction or to expand existing ones despite the above considerations. In particular, the court emphasized that such an outcome would lead to an untenable level of uncertainty for the states 
and that it would have transformed the Convention essentially into a global climate change treaty. Uh, the court found therefore that there was territorial jurisdiction in respect of Portugal but not as regards the other respondent states. Another key issue in Duarte Agostina that the court emphasized was that the principles of subsidiarity and exhaustion of domestic remedies are quite central to the effective functioning of the convention system. Uh, the applicants had essentially asked the court to rule on their claims against Portugal, uh, even though they had not uh, provided an opportunity to the domestic courts to do so beforehand. Uh, this was not accepted by the court and uh, the claim was found to be inadmissible for failure to exhaust domestic remedies. Uh, when domestic courts are deprived of the possibility to establish facts and assess complex evidence, which is particularly important in this context, including scientific and medical evidence, it becomes very challenging for the court afterwards to meaningfully examine the applicant's victim status under the Convention. Dans l'arrêt Climat Seigneurien de Schweiz et autres, la Cour a fixé un seuil élevé pour reconnaître la qualité de victime dans les affaires climatiques. S'agissant des requérants individuels dans de telles affaires, ils doivent démontrer 1. être exposés de manière intense aux effets néfastes du changement climatique, 2 l'existence d'un besoin impérieux d'assurer leur protection individuelle. Dans cet arrêt, la Cour a admis que les vagues de chaleur qui étaient invoquées par les requérantes avaient une incidence sur la qualité de leur vie. Il s'agissait de quatre requérantes individuelles. Mais elle a considéré que les documents à sa disposition ne montraient pas que les requérantes étaient exposées aux effets néfastes du réchauffement climatique ou qu'elles risquaient de s'y trouver exposées à l'avenir dans une telle mesure que cela aurait fait naître un besoin impérieux d'assurer leur protection individuelle. Dans son appréciation, la Cour a bien souligné que le seuil qui s'appliquait à la réalisation des critères euh, requis pour admettre euh, la recevabilité euh, d'une action individuelle était élevé. Et elle appliquait ces mêmes critères dans une autre affaire, l'affaire Carême. Dans cette affaire, la Cour a également conclu que le requérant ne pouvait pas se prévaloir de la qualité de victime compte tenu de l'absence de tout lien pertinent qui le rattachait à la commune de grande sainte Les juridictions françaises, qui avaient déjà connu de son affaire, avaient euh, admis que cette commune était exposée à un risque futur d'inondation, risque lié au réchauffement climatique. Mais la Cour, dans cette affaire, a constaté que le requérant avait quitté la commune en 2019 et qu'il ne résidait plus en France. Dans ces conditions, reconnaître au requérant la qualité de victime au motif qu'il invoquait ressentir une forme d'anxiété face au changement climatique, aurait rendu très difficile la distinction qui existe dans la jurisprudence de la Cour entre l'axio popularis, une voie qui n'est pas reconnue dans le système de la Convention, et d'autres situations dans lesquelles il existe un besoin impérieux d'assurer une protection individuelle contre les atteintes que les effets du changement climatique peuvent apporter à la jouissance des droits fondamentaux des individus. Ce seuil élevé fixé par la Cour s'agissant des requérants individuels a été compensé dans la reconnaissance euh, d'une possibilité plus grande pour les associations de recourir à l'action en justice. Et pour cela, la Cour a tenu compte de la nature particulière du changement climatique. C'est un sujet de préoccupation pour l'humanité tout entière, a-t-elle constaté. Et elle a relevé la nécessité de favoriser la répartition entre les générations de l'effort que la lutte contre le dérèglement climatique implique. Elle en a déduit que ces organismes collectifs, que sont les associations, peuvent être l'unique moyen accessible pour défendre efficacement des intérêts particuliers. Comme la Convention exclut l'action populariste, c'est-à-dire les recours d'intérêts publics, certaines conditions ont été fixées pour que les associations soient regardées comme pouvant agir au nom des personnes physiques et valablement introduire une requête devant la Cour en invoquant le manquement d'un État à prendre les mesures adéquates de protection de ces personnes contre les effets néfastes du changement climatique et fait sur leur vie ou sur leur santé. Dans l'affaire 
Verheyen du climat syrien. La Cour a jugé que l'association qu'il avait saisie remplissait les conditions qu'elle a fixées. Cette association a été légalement constituée. Elle a démontré qu'elle poursuivait un but spécifique conforme à ses objectifs statutaires dans la défense des droits fondamentaux de ses adhérentes, ainsi que d'autres individus touchés. Protection contre les menaces liées au changement climatique dans l'état défendeur. En outre, la Cour a relevé que cette association était véritablement représentative et qu'elle était habilitée pour agir pour le compte des personnes euh, qui pouvaient faire valoir de manière défendable que leur santé, leur bien-être et leur qualité de vie telle que la Convention les protège se trouvaient exposées à des menaces ou des conséquences néfastes spécifiques liées au changement climatique. In its judgment for ein Klima Senior in Schweiz, the court recognized the applicability of Article 8 of the Convention and defined the content of the state's positive obligations thereunder, explaining the differentiated scope of their margin of appreciation in the context of climate change. Put simply, the margin of appreciation is narrower when it comes to the state's commitment to the necessity of combating climate change and its adverse effects and the setting of the requisite aims and objectives in this respect. But it is wide when it comes to the choice of means, including operational choices and policies adopted in order to meet internationally anchored targets and commitments in the light of priorities and resources. As regards the state's positive obligations, the court has found that states have a duty to adopt and to effectively apply in practice regulations and measures capable of mitigating the existing and potentially irreversible future effects of climate change. In this context, when assessing whether a state has remained within its margin of appreciation, the court examines whether the competent domestic authorities be it at the legislative, executive or judicial level, have had due regard to the need to take the essential measures to address climate change, such as quantifying future greenhouse gas emissions and setting out the relevant emissions reduction targets and pathways. In that case, the court found that there were some critical lacunae in the Swiss authorities' process of putting in place the relevant domestic regulatory framework as the authorities failed to act in good time and in an appropriate and consistent manner regarding the devising, development and implementation of the relevant legislative and administrative framework, the court found that Switzerland had exceeded its margin of appreciation and failed to comply with its positive obligations under Article 8 of the Convention. These three climate change rulings form a trilogy as they establish key procedural and substantive convention principles in litigation relating to climate change. Those principles will be applied in other climate change cases pending before the court. However, as the court highlighted in the Swiss case, judicial involvement, whether at national or European level, is clearly insufficient to tackle the effects of climate change. In a democratic society governed by the rule of law, the responsibility in this field lies primarily with the legislative and executive branches of government. The involvement of the judiciary is complementary to those democratic processes and is necessarily limited to ensuring oversight of compliance with legal requirements. As regards the involvement of the Strasbourg Court, it is also dependent on all admissibility requirements having been fulfilled.